Hi everybody, welcome. I've never done one of these uh, on the road with me type videos, so I uh, uh, hope you enjoy the scenery. Uh, <laughs> from what you can see out my driver's side window, uh, this is going to be a little bit different than what I've done on the channel so far. I'm thinking about a little bit of a, a story time um, type of concept. I might might do some of those, uh, some of my own personal uh, uh, stories and events, incidents in my life, in music, and maybe some of my friends as well once we get this rolling. But um, yeah, Dave Letterman used to have uh, stupid pet tricks, and then that morphed into stupid human tricks, and then eventually he had brushes with greatness, if anybody remembers that. And that was, you know, basically innocuous meetings between normal people and celebrities or stars. Uh, not really like big time stuff, but just, uh, uh, you know, bumping into somebody and then saying hi, and then that was it. <laughs> and I have a lot of those stories uh, to tell, but today's is actually pretty substantial. And it centers around uh, someone I've seen some some videos and tributes to recently it kind of jogged my memory to to think about putting this together uh, but Jaco Pastorius uh, was an innovator on the bass the electric bass uh, considered by many I'm not going to say that I agree but considered by many to be the world's greatest uh, you know electric bassist ever the, the world's greatest jazz electric bassist um, he was an immensely talented musician and a troubled person and a fiery personality. So this is the story of my uh, time speaking with and, and meeting or, or brushing with um, Jaco Pastorius. So many years ago, uh, I was working in jazz radio and I was not only hosting a few programs and helping other people produce theirs, but I was producing interviews with uh, whatever musicians I could get uh, to agree to an interview, either live or on the phone. Um, I was also doing some, some print media and did more of that later. So, you know, whatever I could get as far as an interview with somebody, I would try to maximize that. So. A group called PDB was coming to town. Um, Jaco Pastorius, Kenwood Denard, and Hiram Bullock. Hiram Bullock was actually, interestingly enough, David Letterman's guitar player uh, at one time. Um, Kenwood Denard had played with a bunch of different uh, fusion groups, uh, was well known in that genre of music, and especially by drummers, because you know he's an amazing drummer. Uh, played with Brand X, where I first heard him. Um, and Jocko Pastorius is Jocko. You know, Weather Report and his whole, the Jocko Pastorius word about Big Band, his whole storied career. Uh, so they had this super group put together, and I was very excited. I had never seen him live and didn't know much about him at the time. Um, so I arranged a telephone interview with Jocko to be hopefully followed by a live one when he came to town, but it was a preview for their show coming up. I was a young man and relatively inexperienced, probably in my, well, I was maybe 21, 21, um, something like that. And, uh, I got a hold of his management. They arranged a phone interview, you know, call him at this time, which I did. And I was greeted by a very irate, uh, sort of angry and upset that I was, you know, causing him some disruption in the middle of his day, Jaco Pastorius. So uh, I started to, to make some small talk and then get ready to ask some questions. And it goes from bad to worse. Um, he tells me, hurry up, man. I'm, I'm in the middle of a basketball game. This is interrupting my day. I'm in the middle of a basketball game. I'm trying to hustle some basketball. And I have a C note writing on this game. 
right? He had a hundred dollar bet going on. Uh, and I was disrupting that, trying to help him promote his new record and his tour. Uh, so I start to ask him some questions and all of the answers are, you know, flat, yes, no, or just snide. And it starts to degenerate into just raw, vile vulgarity. You know, which I would not be happy with or cool with today, but I probably would handle it better. Um, and it's, of course, much more um, expected today of almost everyone. Um, but back then, there was no way I could even consider using almost anything he said on the radio. And he's getting worse and worse, and he's, he seems to really be enjoying the fact that he's got this young guy trying to interview him, and he's got him walking a tightrope and on eggshells, and uh, is completely in charge of this thing, right? Large and in charge. So I make some kind of comment, like, boy, I'm sure going to have to do a lot of editing to get something on the air out of this. Just sort of an offhand, a little quip, a response, a joke back to what he was saying, but also thinking out loud for real, like, what am I going to do with this? There's almost nothing usable here. And he, it registers with him that... <laughs> that it's not live and he's not holding me hostage on the air which is what he what he really was relishing in the fact apparently I mean I know I'm ascribing motive to the dude but this is what it seemed like to me and I, and I was the guy in the hot seat and as soon as I said I, I'm gonna sure have to do some editing here he went ballistic just a stream of consciousness f-bombs of this that and the other thing and M and Effer, you call me back when, <laughs> when this interview is live. Do you hear me? L-I-V-E live. You bleep it and bleep bleep, click. That was the end of it. I was so distraught. This was a great musician who I, at that time, you know, looked up to and uh, was just sort of in awe of his, his, uh, his reputation, his career, and his music. And he had just, you know dumped all over me and uh, I just had no sense of of what I had there and there was no YouTube there was no viral videos there was no internet there was no you know what was I gonna do with it I couldn't play it on the air so in my haste and in my kind of shameful mourning of this, uh, this situation that just occurred I took the tape off the machine we used to have those old pancakes of um, uh, uh, quarter inch tape and I took it off the machine in the in the production studio and the, the sub control they used to call it and I walked over to what's known as a bulk eraser and I just completely nuked that tape I flipped the switch and erased everything thoroughly so there was no trace of any magnetic iron oxide particles facing in the same direction. <laughs> and, uh, and I forgot about it. And then it was a few years later when I heard on the news about his tragic death. I'm leaving something out. You know, I went to see the band at the uh, Tralthamador Cafe in Buffalo. Um, and I went to see them because I, I think I figured I'd earned the comp tickets that I got. Uh, and they were terrible. These three awesome musicians were terrible together and separately, at least on that night. Hiram Bullock tried desperately to, to make something out of that gig, I could tell. But the other two guys were just non-cooperative. It was crazy. It was loud. It was clearly unrehearsed and unprepared. Uh, the meta-rhythmic orchestra, or this little solo spot that um, Kenwood Denard used to have in the shows where he would, you know, display his, his four-way coordination by playing a beat with two feet and, and one hand while playing a keyboard solo with his left hand and, and uh, you know, singing something. Uh, 
it was not good. It was just not good. I mean, it, it was, he could do it, but it was meaningless. It was terrible and awful. Um, and, and then they ended the night after they did a, they did an encore of, of Birdland, a three piece version of Birdland, which was not good. And, um, you know, in com complete rock and roll fashion, uh, you know, Jocko's doing power chords on the bass and then takes it off and like a battle ax, like whips the thing around and in the air three or four times and then just lets it fly. And Kenwood Denard had a, a, a rack of amps and a, and a monitor set up on his right and he ducks just in time for this thing to miss his head and crash <laughs> into the amp stack. And like that was the end of the show. So. I knew then I wasn't crazy and it wasn't me and it wasn't like just a Twilight Zone experience. This guy really was nuts and he was displaying that. And that was good that I I figured that out because I had considered, there was a time when he was sitting there alone and I considered going up to say hi and or confronting him about the insane situation that I had gone through with him. And, and it reminded me of that later, it reminded me of that George Costanza uh, episode of Seinfeld where he's got the... the the sweater with the chocolate sauce dumped all over it and he's saved it up for years to go talk to the girl and then he just chickens out you know I just I said you know what I I'm not gonna do that and it was good because who knows what would have happened he was really unbalanced um anyway that was the show but it wasn't that many years later that I saw the um the terrible situation that occurred with him um and it was shocking but at the same time it wasn't um, surprising that he had been trying to break into some place in Florida and, and security guards or, or local pay, somebody wound up beating him to death. Um, and as I look more into Jocko's history, which I didn't know about at the time, you know, that he had had several meltdowns on stage and he had a major drug problem and it had caused mental issues. And, you know, he had to bail out of a Playboy Jazz Festival performance that, that wasn't going well. And, um, I didn't know all, all about that when I uh, was interviewing him, or I may have considered asking those questions, or I may have just not done it at all. <laughs> it's hard to say. Um, but uh, it was shocking, but not surprising that that is how he ended, and it is very sad. Um, but whenever people mention Jocko and what a great uh, guy and a great musician he was and a great innovator, I can agree with two out of three of those statements uh, but one of them uh, not so much so that's my story and I'm sticking to it that's my brush with greatness with Jaco Pastorius I held this story back for years I wound up writing a version of it on a, on a blog post years ago just to document it but nobody was really reading it and I was concerned about his legacy and I was concerned about uh frankly you know what I'll you know the haters and the and a possible lawsuit from his family or whatever I don't care. It's time to, to have, you know, some truth be told about some of these situations. As we're talking, you know, 40 years ago, so I don't know, something like that, a long time ago. And before this episode is lost to the dustbin of history, I figured I'd better document it. So there's my story about Jaco Pastorius and my, my meeting him and not meeting him and being thankful for it. See you next time.